Hi everybody and welcome to chapter, chapter 7. Um, in chapter 7 we are going to focus on the courts. Um, the first thing we have to talk about though is jurisdiction. So let's define the concept of jurisdiction because jurisdiction is the area and the subject matter over which a court may exercise legal authority. Uh, there's a specific geographic area and there's a specific area of content that courts cover and they can't uh, go beyond those boundaries because some other court has that jurisdiction. So jurisdiction is a really important concept when we're talking about courts. Um, and for this, for the examples that we're going to, that I'm going to use for this chapter, we're going to focus on the Pennsylvania court system since here at Hack we are based in Pennsylvania. Um, every state is a little bit different, right? Um, but this gives you a general rule of thumb of what the court hierarchy at the state level looks like. So using Pennsylvania as an example, what I like to, to tell my students is think about this as a pyramid, right? Um, and each level as we go up, the stakes get higher and higher in the different court depending on the jurisdiction. Um, but we start at the bottom, and the bottom level of jurisdiction would be the Magisterial District Justice, which is often abbreviated as the MDJ. The Magisterial District Justice um, deals with smaller issues, um, civil issues under, I believe, I want to say under $6,000 might be 12,000, six or six or 12, but small um, amounts of civil issues they deal with, um, small monetary issues. Um, they execute civil service, things like uh, protections from abuse, evictions, things of that nature. And they deal, like I said, with those small civil cases. The thing that's unique about the MDJ uh, here in Pennsylvania is you do not have to have a background in law enforcement. You do not have to back, have a background in courts or even a legal degree. You simply have to run for office. It is an elected position. And whoever receives uh, the greatest amount of votes is the one who becomes the MDJ for a period of time in that jurisdiction. Um, you could be a plumber. You could be a school teacher and just run for office. If you get enough votes uh, and you win, what will then happen is you will go to what is essentially an academy for six months uh, where you live um, and you will take classes and become, you know, learn how to become a magisterial district justice, learn the crimes code in Pennsylvania and how to execute your duties. Um, that is very unique to the state of Pennsylvania. And it's a very interesting thing that just anybody can do it off the street, right? So long as you get enough votes. That would be the base of our pyramid, the bottom court. If we want to step above, we go to the Court of Common Pleas. We call the Court of Common Pleas here in Pennsylvania a court of general jurisdiction. So it hears more serious crimes. It hears the more serious civil complaints where the financial stakes are much higher. Um, this is the court most people you know, generally think of that if you get arrested and it's something that's you know, bigger than a citation or bigger than a small offense, this is where you're going to go to have your case be heard, um, the Court of Common Pleas. So, as we continue up the hierarchy, above the Court of Common Pleas, there are two courts that sit above that. There is the Superior Court and there's the Commonwealth Court. And I'm going to tell you the difference between each one. So the Commonwealth Court hears only government-related cases here in Pennsylvania. If it's anything else, it will never go to the Commonwealth, excuse me, the Commonwealth Court. The Superior Court hears appellate cases. So decisions that were made in the Commonwealth Court, or excuse me, in the Court of Common Pleas, sorry, I'm getting confused, in the Court of Common Pleas, that if you're unhappy with the outcome and you are the defendant and you want to appeal, this is where you will appeal, to the Superior Court. And this is true for both civil offenses and criminal offenses. Once more, if you go to the appellate process at the Superior Court and you're unhappy with the outcome of your case, there's one more place you can go here in the Pennsylvania court hierarchy system, and that is the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court, and that is the top of our pyramid. That's the top of our hierarchy. It is the highest court system that we have in the state of Pennsylvania, and the jurisdiction of the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court is to hear all appellate cases that continue above and beyond the Superior Court. This is the court of last resort for the state of Pennsylvania. However, it is not the court of last resort, period. You can go to the PA State Supreme Court. You can appeal the outcome of your case. And if you're unhappy with it, you still have one more option. And that option is to appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States, which is the law of the land. It is the big dog on the block. Full disclosure, I love Supreme Court 
cases. I love constitutional law. So this is something that's something of a passion of mine. Um, you'll see me get really excited and detailed about this. I hope you find my love in your heart too. Um, but anyway, so I want to tell you how it works. How do you get to the Supreme Court of the United States? Right. Well, first, you can't just jump there. You can't just jump there. You have to go through all of the options in that hierarchy in your state. You have to exhaust every step of the appellate process uh, before you can even begin to um, petition for a case at the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court every year gets thousands upon thousands of cases petitioned to them. And they certainly don't hear all of them. They certainly don't hear all of them. They just don't have the time. OK, um, there's just too many. So there are a select few that are chosen. Right. Um, people are often surprised to hear that you know this is a ballpark number. Generally speaking, uh, the Supreme Court every year will choose probably between somewhere between 110 to 130 cases. They might hear a little bit more, a little bit less, um, but that's it. That's it. So in order to be chosen to be heard in the United States Supreme Court, it's kind of like winning the lottery because thousands of cases appeal and very few people make it. So for the people who do make it there to be heard by the high court, uh, how, how does that happen? Well, um, there's a process. In order to be one of those 130 cases, the Supreme Court has to grant what we call certiori. It's also frequently referred to as granting cert for short. And basically what that is, is it's a fancy phrase for saying, yeah, we'll hear your case. We will, we've decided as a group, we are gonna hear your case. If they decide to not hear your case, you're out of luck. This is it. It's the very end of the road. Whatever happened at your state Supreme Court level is the ruling that stands, right? But if they grant cert, you still have a chance uh, to, to continue the appellate process and to overturn the outcome of the case at the previous appellate level. So how do they grant cert? How do they determine this? Well, there's something that is called the rule of four. And this is where the nine justices, there are nine, by the way, and that is purposeful. The fact that it's an odd number of justices is on purpose so that there can't be any ties because this is the court of last resort. There must be an answer. There's nowhere else to go, so there cannot be a tie. So there are nine justices, which means there's always a tiebreaker. There's always a tiebreaker. Um, but how do, they, how do they determine how to grant cert? Well, those nine justices come together. They have a bazillion people who clerk for them because these nine people cannot call through all of the legal paperwork that comes to them in a given calendar year. You know, and there's a couple of ways they determine. First, they tend to lean towards hot button issues. And what do I mean by a hot button issue? Uh, what I mean is something that has been discussed, it's controversial, There's it's gray area, there's no clear outcome, um, and it's made its way through the appellate courts and the Supreme Court says, okay, we're finally going to um, you know, put down a final answer on this. It hasn't happened yet, but a really good example of this would be the legalization of marijuana, right? At this point, we have, you know, I don't know, it's, it's something like legal at the, the state level in like 33 states, give or take. It is still illegal at the federal level, right? The federal government could come in and shut down those dispensaries, those farms at any point, right? Because federal law, as you remember, trumps state law. However, if that happened and somebody pursued the federal government and sued them and went through every step of the appellate court, that would likely be a, a case that the Supreme Court would say, hey, for years, everybody's been talking about this is an issue that needs to be settled. The states are okay with it. The federal government's not okay with it. We need to make a call. So that's what I mean when I say a hot button issue. They're going to look for something that has been in the public consciousness uh, where there isn't a clear and defined answer and say, we need to rule and provide a clear and defined answer. So that is one thing that they look for when they choose a case and grant cert. But the way they do it, the real nuts and bolts of how they do it, is the nine justices come together, they review all these cases that their clerks bring them, and they vote. And there's something called the rule of four. Four justices must vote in order to hear the case. If four justices agree, yes, this is a case that we need to hear, that we need to rule on, then they grant certiorari. And if granted certiorari, you're going to the Supreme Court and whatever they say is the final word on the matter. The United States Supreme Court is the highest court of the land. They are the federal court. Um, it is the court of last resort and what they say goes. The interesting part about this is what they say goes, 
But it may not be forever because there are cases that have come before a Supreme Court and it has been ruled upon and it is the law of the land. And 30 or 40 years later, the same issue comes before the court. Typically, there are some new people on the bench and they rule in a completely different way. But as long as they decide, as long as that stands, that is the law of the land until it is ruled upon again. However, I will put the caveat in that it's very rare for, for the same issue to continually make its way back into the court. Those are going to be your really controversial issues um, where the social tides have changed and people feel passionately and are arguing for a, legis a, a legal change. So how do you become a Supreme Court justice? Um, well, you are appointed by the sitting president. When a vacancy comes available, the president in office at the time gets to choose. Uh, largely speaking, the person that the president chooses to appoint, they are vetted, um, they are questioned, they you know have a whole, they have hearings and so forth. Um, but largely, the vast majority of the time, that person is going to get confirmed. Once in a very great while, we go through these hearings and there's negative reaction from politicians who are asking questions from from society um and once in a great while the person who is appointed by the president or the sitting president president does not get affirmed right and we actually call this getting borked there this only ha this has only happened like my lord like maybe three times in history and the first time was in the 1970s and it was a guy named i think robert is his first name robert borg and he went up and he was the first guy that they questioned him and they went through the vetting process and came back and said "Uh, -uh we don't want him right and so his claim to fame his legacy is that his last name became a verb and it, this verb bork to be borked now means that you have been nominated by the supreme court but you have been denied your nomination based on the vetting process. Uh, it's a very rare. It happened to him, Mr. Bork. It happened to, do, 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 I'm thinking of a couple, somebody under the Bush administration, GW. It was a woman. I, I can picture her face. I can't think of her name. Um, and somebody under the Obama administration as well. They were all nominated, but they were Borked during the vetting process. So it does happen. But for those who do not get Borked, who make it to the Supreme Court, it is a lifetime appointment. You are there as a justice as long as you want to be there. And if that means until the day you die, that's what it means, right? Um, if you choose to retire, you may do so. You know, there are many who have. Sandra Day O'Connor sat on the bench for a very long time. She chose to retire. Her husband was suffering from Alzheimer's disease. Uh, she knew she didn't have a lot of time left with him. She wanted to spend time with him and her family. So she retired. She chose to retire. However, many of the judges hold on to those seats until their very last breath. Ruth Bader Ginsburg is a really good example. Scalia is another where they die while they're actually sitting on the bench because it is a very powerful position, right? And even though the court is not supposed to be partisan, it still very much is. And you often, you will have people who lean to the left, you have people who lean to the right, and then you'll have moderates in the middle, which we call the swing vote, because you can almost always bank that those that lean to the left will vote left on an issue, those that lean to the right will vote right, and then those moderates, those ones in the middle, we call them the swing vote because they often determine the outcome of a case. We know how everybody else is going to vote, but you guys in the middle, we don't know which way you're going to cast your vote. And those swing votes are often the ones that determine the outcome. Does that moderate swing left? Do they swing right? At the end of the day, it's what determines the law of the land in the United States. Now, this lifetime appointment is uh, very controversial, especially as time goes by. We as human beings are living longer, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that we're living with greater quality, right? Um, our bodies live, but our minds decline. And there's a lot of controversy about, well, what happens if we get a justice on the bench? Who gets dementia or who gets Alzheimer's? You know, they are the only person who can relinquish that position. What if they have such cognitive decline that um, they can't or they won't, but they literally can't execute their responsibilities anymore? So in recent decades, that discussion about the lifetime appointment has been very controversial. But as it stands currently, this is where we are. It's yours until you decide to retire or until you die. Many who decide to retire or as they are getting older will say, hey, um, I will wait until a president is in office of my party and then I will retire so they can replace my position with somebody from my party. Right. Um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg is an example of the opposite. Uh, she held on to her position um, for a very, very long time. She thought she would make it into another um, administration and she did not. And she died while she was still holding that position. And the op her, the party opposite of her held office and they appointed 
you know, not somebody who was on the left, but somebody who was on the right, right? So it is a dicey game, right? It's a dicey game of, of politics. It's a dicey game of power. Um, and that lifetime appointment can be very, very controversial. All right. I will see you guys in chapter eight, courtroom workers.